Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, first, as always, I need to do a few housekeeping notes. Um, this event is being recorded, and the recording will be posted online afterwards. In addition, all of the slides are going to be available online at urban.org slash events, and I suspect also at the Federal Reserve Board website, certainly the governor's speech will be. Um, all of you participants are muted, but we encourage you to send questions or comments, put them in the Q&A box, please, at any time. And if you want to join the conversation on social media, please tweet using the hashtag live at urban. Well, uh, this is probably a crowd that knows this history, so I'll be very brief. Um, for a number of years, there has been a broad consensus on the need for modernization of CRA regulations, although far less consensus on what form modernization might take. Um, uh, after the OCC issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking in 2018, last December 2019, the OCC and the FDIC jointly released a proposed rule to modify the CRA regulations. Now, historically, the banking agencies have acted in concert when issuing these and similar regs, so it was notable that the Fed did not join the other agencies at that time. And in January, Federal Reserve Governor Lael Brainerd uh, came to Urban, back when you actually physically came someplace to do an event, uh, to describe an intensive analytical effort by the Fed staff meant to inform modernization and offered what was then clearly an alternative approach. Governor Brainerd said at the time, major updates to the CRA regulations happen once every few decades. So it is much more important to get reform right than to do it quickly. The OCC had provided a 60-day comment period during which they received 7,500 comments on its proposed rule. And yet, only uh, weeks later, on May 20th, the OCC, this time entirely alone without either the Fed or the FDIC, issued a final rule which, for technical reasons, actually goes into effect on October 1st, uh, about 10 days from now. But most of its provisions need to be implemented by institutions by January 1st of 20. 2023 or 2024. At a time when the pandemic and global economic issues might have made it difficult for uh, uh, the Fed governors to focus on CRA, um, the board chair Powell has instead chosen to confirm both last spring and again at the end of the summer that he had confidence in the Fed staff's analytical work and Governor Brainerd's leadership on CRA regulatory reforms. And then this morning, the board voted unanimously to issue its own advance notice of proposed rulemaking, what we'll talk about today as an ANPR. Remarks mentioned the high quality of staff data and analysis, statutory purpose of the statute in meeting the needs of local LMI communities, as well as the importance of both I'm sorry, constituent consistency, flexibility, and transparency. Um, this is a remarkably detailed ANPR, but in essence, it, and in many ways, it's a draft proposal, but with a lot of questions where the Fed is clearly seeking comment, and I suspect many on this call and elsewhere will be active in providing them input on it. While few of us have entirely digested the new proposal, we're lucky indeed to have Governor Brainerd provide us with an overview of the approach and the work that the board staff has done upon which this proposal rests. I believe you all know that Governor Brainerd has been a member of the board since 2014. There she is the administrative governor and chair of four committees, including the Consumer and Community Affairs Committee. She previously served as undersecretary of the US Treasury under President Obama and deputy national economic advisor for international under President Clinton, where we had the pleasure of working together. Um, let me just say, Governor, well, that we haven't entirely digested this yet, um, again, that from the Urban Institute's perspective, we really commend you and the Fed staff for the data-driven approach that you've taken to this issue. It's welcome news indeed. Uh, so with that, let me turn it over to Governor Brainerd to provide us a brief overview. And there she is. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure uh, to be back uh, at the Urban Institute uh, with you, Sarah Rosen Wartell. Uh, and I also look forward uh, to hearing from Lori Goodman, from Ellen Seidman, and from Noel Coyo. Uh, as Sarah noted, today the Federal Reserve Board unanimously approved an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, an ANPR, that would strengthen, clarify, and tailor the CRA regulation to better meet the law's core purpose. 
The CRA was one of several landmark civil rights laws to address systemic inequities in credit access. The CRA was intended to reinforce the other statutes in addressing redlining, wherein banks declined to make loans or extend other financial services in neighborhoods of largely black and other minority households, in part based on government maps that literally delimited these neighborhoods in red as high credit risk areas. And I want to just show you uh, what those maps look like. Uh, and so let's see if we can put up a slide showing uh, that map uh, for Atlanta. And you can also see the description of that neighborhood on the right. Even with these critical laws, the legacy of discriminatory lending and systemic inequity in credit access remains. The typically minority neighborhoods demarcated in red in the old color-coded maps tend to be characterized by worse economic performance and opportunity even today. Beyond these specific neighborhoods, research and surveys indicate there are ongoing racial disparities, whether it be for small business loans, and you can see that here in figure two on the next slide, or for home ownership rates, which are 30 percentage points higher for blacks than whites, and the wealth gap has proven very persistent since the time of these very important laws. Recent events, highlighted and exacerbated these challenges. When we last met in January to discuss the CRA, we didn't know the tremendous hardship and heartache the COVID-19 pandemic would cause, especially for groups with thin financial buffers, including many low and moderate income LMI neighborhoods, black and Latinx workers, and workers and entrepreneurs affiliated with small businesses. In parallel, the tragic death of George Floyd has ignited a national discussion about racial injustice and a renewed commitment to take action to address systemic inequities. The CRA is a seminal statute that remains as important as ever as the nation confronts challenges associated with racial equity and the COVID-19 pandemic. We must ensure that CRA is a strong and effective tool to address ongoing systemic inequities and in access to credit and financial services for LMI and minority individuals and communities. By conferring an affirmative obligation on banks to help meet the credit needs in all of the neighborhoods they serve, CRA prompts banks to be not only more active lenders in LMI areas, but also important participants in broader efforts to revitalize communities. Reforms to CRA should further strengthen that important engagement between banks and their communities. The ANPR that we released today incorporates ideas from public comments on past rulemaking notices, research, and our discussions with the other banking agencies. It also reflects the 29 CRA roundtables we held across the country. I traveled to Colorado to participate in the first roundtable and to hear from women, small business owners, and minority small business owners about the loans that are enabling their businesses to thrive and the bankers who are providing credit and community development in their communities. I've made similar visits to communities ranging from El Paso's Colonias to Kansas City, from Pine Ridge to Milwaukee, from the Mississippi Delta to Ferguson, Missouri, and from Hazard, Kentucky to Rochester, New York. Despite wide variations in all of these places, I met people working hard to strengthen their communities. To ensure its continued effectiveness in supporting these efforts, the CRA regulation has to evolve along with changes in banking and community development. So the board's ANPR seeks to advance the CRA's core purpose of addressing inequities in credit access and ensuring an inclusive financial services industry. It also seeks to provide more certainty and consistency to tailor expectations and to minimize burden. And finally, we intend for the feedback on the ANPR to provide a foundation for the banking agencies to converge on a consistent regulatory approach. So let me go through uh, the ways that we are seeking to advance these goals. First of all, we seek to modernize CRA in a way that significantly expands financial inclusion. To strengthen the CRA's role in, in financial inclusion, the ANPR proposes to expand and clarify activities that support minority depository institutions, MDIs, as well as CDFIs, 
It would clarify that banks can receive credit for partnerships with MDIs and other mission-oriented institutions nationwide, and that such activities would be considered part of a pathway to an outstanding, potentially. Furthermore, for regulated MDIs, investments in other MDIs and in their own institutions could be considered as enhancing CRA performance. Moreover, the ANPR proposes to designate certain areas based on persistent inequities where banks could receive credit for activities that often lie beyond the boundaries of a bank's branches. The ANPR raises a variety of additional ideas that could be significant for financial inclusion. It proposes giving banks greater certainty that their community development activities will be considered in broader statewide and regional areas to enable banks to help address needs in credit deserts if they have the capacity to do so. And it considers that loans with the smallest businesses, smallest farms, and minority-owned small businesses might be considered particularly impactful and responsive to community needs. And finally, the ANPR is seeking feedback on what additional modifications and approaches could strengthen the CRA regulation in addressing systemic equities and credit access for minority individuals and communities. Second, it's important for the CRA to ensure that a wide range of LMI needs are met. We heard from stakeholder feedback that both retail and community development activities are important. So we propose to assess large retail banks using separate, separate tests. Stakeholder feedback has highlighted that retail lending, retail services, community development financing, and community development services are all essential for LMI communities to thrive. So separate assessments of each will support robust bank engagement with their communities through this whole slate of channels. Some of these activities lend themselves to a primarily qualitative review. For example, the ANPR highlights essential banking services that are responsing, responsive to community needs, such as customer support provided in multiple languages and flexible branch hours to accommodate LMI customers' work schedules. Although we concluded the value of services to a local community doesn't lend itself easily to a monetary metric, the ANPR does propose introducing some quantitative benchmarks where these are appropriate. Third, it proposes to modernize CRA assessment areas in recognition that reliance on mobile and internet banking has increased in the 25 years since the CRA regulation was last substantially revised. We still maintain a significant focus on branches, given their importance to individuals and communities. Beyond that, for large banks that conduct a significant amount of lending and deposit taking outside of their facility-based assessment areas, the NPR presents some ideas for determining where banks should be assessed outside of where their branches are located. Defining lending-based assessment areas is one option, and we present some preliminary analysis that suggests that that lending currently outside of assessment areas is widely dispersed and often occurs in places that are already well served. Defining assessment areas based on deposits is another option, but it would entail some additional data reporting burden. And we don't currently have the data to analyze this option closely. For internet banks, which lend across a broad area with few or no branch locations, we suggest a nationwide assessment area may advance the CRA's goals more effectively than the current practice of assessing them solely where they have a headquarters office. Fourth, the ANPR seeks to provide greater clarity and consistency through tailored performance evaluations. Responding to calls for greater certainty, the ANPR introduces a metrics-based approach that is data-driven and based on a database we constructed reflecting over 6,000 written public CRA evaluations. Separating the retail test and the community development test provides greater scope to tailor those metrics to local market conditions. And this would permit clear quantitative thresholds to be established for the level of retail lending and community development financing associated with a satisfactory uh, CRA rating. For the 
retail lending subtest, which would apply to large retail banks and any small banks that choose to opt in, banks could earn a presumption of a satisfactory conclusion in an assessment area by reaching clear thresholds of lending to LMI borrowers and neighborhoods in each of the major product lines. That tailoring to local conditions matters a lot. So if you look at figure four, you can see that when we compare, sorry, you can go back for a second to figure three. Figure three just shows the basic structure of the tests, the four tests that would apply to large uh, retail banks. Moving to figure four, you can see that for Adams County, Colorado and Seminole County, Florida, there are very substantial differences both in the share of LMI families in the assessment area as well as in the share of mortgages that go to LMI borrowers. So a single threshold wouldn't make sense to capture those differences in LMI lending opportunities. The thresholds would be based on local data that reflect the credit needs and opportunities among LMI individuals, small businesses, and small farms, and market data that reflects the level of LMI lending in that area by all lenders. The ANPR also considers using those same metrics relative to performance ranges to produce more granular retail lending subtest conclusions of outstanding satisfactory needs to improve or substantial noncompliance and we encourage commenters to make use of the CRA analytics data tables that we published in March in order to evaluate the presumption threshold options and performance ranges and provide feedback. For the community development financing subtest, the board is proposing to measure a large retail bank's community development loans and investments relative to its deposits in each assessment area. The thresholds for this test too would be calibrating using local, and in this case also national data. When we looked at past performance evaluations, we found that community development financing varies widely across different assessment areas, reflecting different levels of community development capacity and the unique needs and challenges of the local community. So if you look at figure five in the blue bars, you can see that comparing San Diego, California, the total dollar amount of banks' community financing activities to their deposits is three times higher than in Little Rock, Arkansas. In addition, as you can see from the green bars, metropolitan areas overall have a higher level of community development financing relative to deposits than rural areas overall. So for those reasons, we thought it was important to tailor this subtest using thresholds based both on local differences and national differences, as well as making sure they adjust automatically uh, to changes over time. To provide certainty and transparency, the retail lending and community development financing thresholds would be made available in simple, regularly updated dashboards that banks could use to compare their level of activity to the thresholds in each assessment area on an ongoing basis. And you can see that in figure six, which provides an example of a retail lending dashboard for home mortgages. So you can probably um, wrap up the slide presentation there uh, and I'll continue. The proposed separate subtests would ensure expectations are tailored to the size and business models of different banks as well. For instance, wholesale and limited purpose banks would be evaluated only on their community development activities. It's important for smaller banks to be able to remain under the current more qualitative approach if they so choose. Of course, small banks would have the option to have their retail lending evaluated under the metrics-based approach and they could elect to have their retail services and community development activities evaluated, again, if they choose. Six, the ANPR seeks comment on striking an appropriate balance between providing greater certainty on how banks are assessed through the increased use of metrics, while also minimizing the associated data collection reporting burden. In an effort to reduce that burden, the proposed metrics rely to the greatest extent possible on existing data collections and public data sources, and they would exempt small banks from deposit and certain other data collection requirements. 
Large banks currently report community development loans at an aggregated level, and of course a bank may share information with its examiner on its community development loans and investments in specific assessment areas. However, the bank doesn't formally report data for each assessment area, nor are the data currently available through other sources. Without reporting that data more consistently to provide the basis for a comparison, it would be very difficult to measure and evaluate community development performance for large banks in a consistent and predictable way. Seventh, we propose updating and clarifying which community development activities qualify to provide greater uncertainty. Sorry, a greater certainty. The ANPR proposes to publish and regularly update an illustrative list of qualifying activities. We also propose to establish a pre-approval process so that banks can propose a community development loan investment or service to their examiner to determine whether it will qualify before proceeding. In addition, the ANPR seeks feedback about clarifying the definitions of qualifying activities and broadening them in targeted ways. For example, we're considering defining CRA eligible activities that create or preserve naturally occurring affordable housing and whether to broaden the set of volunteer activities that would qualify in rural areas. The board also proposes clarifying when a government or tribal plan is required to qualify activities that revitalize and stabilize communities. This might be especially important in Indian country where we wanna encourage banks to make impactful investments that have the support of tribal governments and to increase certainty that these activities qualify. Finally, stakeholder feedback emphasized that smaller retail banks play a vital role in many underserved rural communities. Accordingly, the ANPR provides small banks in rural areas flexibility for operating in just a portion of a large county. In addition, the ANPR proposes to revise the definition of community development services to include a wider range of activities that address the particular needs of rural areas. It's been 25 years since the last significant update to the CRA regulation, so it's important to get reform right. We're providing an extended 120-day comment period to allow ample time for thoughtful feedback from a broad set of stakeholders. In the weeks and months ahead, we look forward to reviewing your comments and analyzing options for greater impact, including changes to address the inequities and challenges faced by minority communities and individuals. This feedback is critically important and we're ready to listen. Stakeholders have expressed strong support for the agencies to work together to modernize the CRA by reflecting stakeholder views and providing a long period for public comment. The ANPR is intended to build a foundation for the banking agencies to converge on a consistent approach that has broad support among stakeholders. With the continued ideas and engagement from a broad set of stakeholders, I'm confident we can come together on a stronger, transparent, and tailored approach to CRA that will benefit LMI communities across the country for years to come. So with that, uh, Sarah, I'm gonna wrap up and, and hand it back over to you. Great, thanks so much. Great, uh, thanks so much. Uh, Are we having an echo problem? Okay, we seem better now. People hearing me? Yes, okay, we're good. Uh, great, thank you, Governor Brainerd, for that overview. And um, I, think, I think what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna ask you a series of questions that we got in the chat uh, and from other people who submitted them to us in their registration, and then we'll turn uh, it over to the panel. Um, so the first question comes from uh, Nick Timuros of the Wall Street Journal, and um, I, I think he's referencing, uh, in essence, and in, in anticipation, a comment you just made at the end there, which is your hope is that the uh, longer time for the comment period and the evidentiary base, base you hope will eventually lead to the regulatory agencies converging on a consistent approach. Um, uh, so. Uh, Nick's comment uh, is, I think, to the same point. He says, it's unusual for the federal bank regulators to move in separate directions on such a major rule, especially for something like CRA. 
to what extent do you expect the public feedback on the new rulemaking by the Fed would create an opportunity to fashion a rule that the FDIC and the OCC might eventually adopt, ultimately adopt? Is this your goal? And do you have any indication from the other regulators that this process could eventually conclude with one interagency rulemaking? Governor? Yeah, so thank you. Um, it's a good question. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to recognize uh, that with the path we're on today, there are effectively two separate rules. Uh, we heard consistently from stakeholders uh, that uh, it's important for them that agencies uh, take a consistent approach as they have traditionally. Um, and that will be uh, good both for uh, the communities for whom uh, CRA is so critically important, but also the banks um, for consistency in evaluations and uh, for consistency of expectations. So we did uh, want to provide a very long comment period, 120 days. We did choose to issue an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. <clears throat> and of course, there is a window um, in which uh, there uh, is plenty of opportunity, I think, for um, the agencies uh, to benefit from feedback from uh, stakeholders and to come together uh, on a consistent approach. That's certainly uh, my hope. Uh, I think it's the hope of uh, my colleagues uh, at the board. And of course, we have continued to be um, in close consultation with uh, the other agencies. We worked uh, with uh, OCC and the FDIC very collaboratively for a long time. You'll see many common elements. So yes, we are uh, hopeful. Uh, and that is uh, precisely the reason uh, that we have a very long comment period um, and that we went with uh, an NPR that asks a lot of questions. Great, thank you. Um, so CRA as a statute mentions community needs, but it doesn't mention race. Um, and it was very noticeable that you started your presentation today with a map from the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which uh, suggests to me clearly that our nation's history of uh, not simply um, uh, individual acts of discrimination, but de jure discrimination and redlining um, and the needs of black, indigenous and communities of color for access to credit is very much on your mind and I suspect on many of your colleagues. It's clearly um, part of a larger conversation we're having in the country right now about structural racism. Um, and I'm told that you also talked particularly about uh, the needs for access to credit for uh, communities of color, even in your remarks this morning. So I'd be curious if you would uh, talk a little bit about how you see those issues intersecting with um, the role and responsibility of community of the CRA statute and the regulatory agencies under it to pursue the needs of local communities. Yeah, so um, I think uh, we very much um, keep uh, at the forefront of our thinking uh, the history uh, of the CRA. The CRA was enacted uh, as one of several landmark civil rights laws uh, that were as a group designed to address systemic inequities uh, in credit access. And uh, it, it was in particular in response uh, to redlining, uh, which uh, as I noted earlier, uh, led to systemic uh, inequities, lack of access to credit and other financial services for redlined predominantly minority areas. So I think we need to keep that in mind um, and of course, uh, with the events uh, that uh, we are currently as a nation grappling with, both the disproportionate um, hardships associated with the COVID-19 pandemic that has hit LMI communities and uh, Black and Latinx communities particularly hard, uh, as well as uh, the tragic death of George Floyd and the national discussion about uh, racial inequities uh, those things I think are important um, as we seek feedback on how to strengthen the CRA and renew its purpose for today's challenges. The statute, as you say, is focused on LMI communities and we think it has historically worked very well to address uh, those interrelated challenges. 
and we think we can continue to do that. We ask questions specifically about that, but I think it's important, uh, and Sarah, you know this because Urban uh, Institute uh, provides a lot of the research. Those um, systemic inequities uh, along racial lines are still very much uh, in evidence today, whether it comes to home ownership rates or the wealth gap, uh, small business loans. Uh, so we think the CRA is a powerful tool um, and we ask questions specifically about that. Right, um, well, I'm gonna uh, continue on that line in a minute. Um, just a small follow-on question that we had a, a question from Al Pina, who is chair and CEO of the Florida Minority Community Reinvestment Coalition. And he's asking a, a specific question about small business credit. And we have a number of questions about small business um, that um, perhaps we'll touch on. Um, he's specifically asking about um, uh, section 1071 of ECOA, which was an amendment um, to ECOA in the Dodd-Frank Act, um, which is, the CFPB is responsible for rulemaking under, and they just issued a proposed rule. And specifically, it is about um, reporting on access to small business lending uh, by communities of color or for communities of color. And if that rulemaking completes, it's a potentially a, a important new, essentially humda data for small business lending of a kind that we wouldn't have had before. Um, and I just wondered whether if you would chat for a minute about small business lending generally under the rule and specifically whether information like that could be very, uh, become a basis for some of the assessment that you're talking about in the rule. Yeah, so I, I would say that we do um, recognize how important uh, small businesses are uh, for employment, for the vitality of LMI communities, and how important in turn uh, credit access is. And so there are a, a whole variety of um, steps in uh, the ANPR uh, that are intended uh, to strengthen support for small businesses as well as small farms. Um, the proposed retail lending metrics, which have uh, a separate um, analysis uh, for small businesses, they focus on the number of loans uh, rather than the dollar amount, for instance, to reduce incentives to focus on larger loans uh, for uh, larger businesses, for instance. Uh, we also um, seek feedback on incentives for banks to engage in activities with the smallest businesses and minority owned businesses. Um, and propose an approach to establish clearer standards um, for when small business activities uh, have to demonstrate LMI job creation, retention, or improvement. Um, with regard to data, you know, we do um, lean heavily on public data sources um, for calibrating uh, benchmarks in each uh, area. So of course, having additional uh, small business data become available in a regular reporting uh, kind of format is extremely helpful. Um, but of course, we are uh, also targeting the ANPR to use to the greatest extent possible existing small business data. And so the proposal um, leans very heavily on existing sources of data and asks questions about whether thresholds should be changed. Um, so we have a number of questions, both about um, about technology and how it's changing the both the core business of these institutions and potentially how it might change institutions' abilities to serve um, LNMI communities and communities of color. Um, so uh, one question just was generally um, about online mortgage lenders and their data, how it's reported, and how you were thinking about uh, the uh, existence of so much of the mortgage lending business and other credit lending business being online, how that uh, is affected, how that affects the way that you've approached the rulemaking here. And I'm going to ask um, a second question because you, I suspect these will be related. Um, um, uh, I'm sorry, the first question came from Seymour Lyer, who's director of the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance. Um, and our second question comes from Shekhar Narasimhan, who's a um, multifamily mortgage lender and investment banker. Um, Shekhar asked, does the Fed believe that we can really help expand small business lending by banks without fintech? And if so, um, how might you approach fintech non-banks to encourage uh, the growth of small business lending by them or their 
coverage right now, I gather, not under CRA. So just, I, I think maybe first, if you would just sort of lift back up and talk to us a, a minute about technology and the way it's affected the landscape in which CRA lands. And then if you might talk briefly about both um, uh, small business lending and uh, mortgage lending. Yeah. So first of all, um, I think one of the things uh, that we are trying to uh, balance um, in this proposal is uh, the um, very important services um, that are associated with bank branches. We see that in research. Uh, we hear it from stakeholders. On the other hand, LMI communities, like every other type of community um, uh, across the country, uh, is increasingly relying on uh, mobile and online delivery channels uh, for financial services. And of course, that has been accelerated by COVID. So we want to take that into account. We want to give credit to financial institutions for making products that are targeted to LMI communities available through mobile sources. Um, and so we do uh, expand the kinds of products that might be given credit, for instance, uh, under um, the retail services uh, subtest. And we also um, provide a greater recognition for ways that mobile and online delivery channels might be serving LMI communities. Um, we do uh, spend a, a, a section of the ANPR uh, looking at this question of what does online and uh, mobile heavy reliance mean in terms of capturing assessment areas appropriately. I mentioned that earlier, but one of the big questions, of course, is for internet only banks and for banks that heavily lend and take deposits uh, through mobile and online, uh, does it make sense to define additional assessment areas and how do we do that um, via deposits or lending? Um, and of course, uh, will there be associated data burden? With regard to both mortgages and small business, Obviously, online is a very important uh, delivery channel for both of those products. Now, we don't um, we don't propose to go outside the boundaries of the law, and so of course, you know, the uh, supervised entities that are uh, within uh, the parameters of the CRA are the are the focus of our work here. Um, but we do think that partnerships, for instance, um, with uh, mission-oriented institutions that are using technology platforms very effectively to uh, reach small business and uh, other kinds of borrowers in LMI communities, that those should receive uh, credit. So uh, a couple other bundles of questions that we are getting um, are about the uh, drawing of the parameters of assessment areas and also about the role for community groups in the process of, um, assess, of doing the assessments and how that would work. And then finally, also questions about whether there might be detriments to ratings um, if there are uh, potentially community harms, either from engaging in practices that are harming. One question asks about um, displacement. So rather than repeat them all, let me just say that these, that sort of this, this body of questions comes from both David Schechter uh, WFA, who is a reporter who was asking in particular about um, whether or not we simply assume that people's assessments, uh, statements of the assessment area are correct and they, we don't necessarily have scrutiny on them. Uh, secondly, uh, Greg Squires, who's a professor at GW, has asked us more about the role of community groups in both developing and assessing plans and how might that be affected by the rules. And then finally, um, Kevin Stein of the California Reinvestment Coalition is asking about these potential um, uh, harms that sometimes institutions might do through either discriminatory practices or potentially, and this is more um, uh, uh, difficult to assess perhaps, but displacement, how do the process that's imagined here, might those questions come up in, those, in that case? Sorry, I'll, a three-part question, but I think they're all related. Well, let me see if I can uh, if I can remember all three of those. They're both uh, they're all three uh, very weighty issues, uh, which we thought a lot about. So we do um, want community engagement uh, to remain um, uh, very uh, squarely at the heart of the CRA evaluation process, um, and uh, by including a variety of areas, for instance, where qualitative assessments 
would continue to be the primary mechanism uh, for making assessments. That community engagement, we think, is um, retained and strengthened uh, in the areas where uh, it will matter um, the most. Um, we also um, propose uh, retaining and strengthening the strategic plan process and suggest a number of procedural changes there um, that would make it uh, easier and uh, more powerful for uh, communities to engage on those strategic plans, which, as you know, require um, communities uh, to engage on them before uh, they are accepted. Um, with respect to um, the uh, where the benefits um, are uh, focused. We think it's very important, um, first of all, that um, for uh, community development activities, that they retain that focus on uh, LMI neighborhoods and LMI individuals. So we retain a very strong focus there. Um, and moreover, uh, we also see that um, the uh, the, the, the requirements in the CRA uh, that banks meet um, the needs of their whole communities are very tightly linked um, to fair lending. So obviously a bank that isn't, uh, that isn't able to um, fulfill its fair lending responsibilities would not be meeting the needs of its entire um, community. So we, we retain and strengthen that nexus. We think it's, uh, it's well uh, rooted uh, both in the um, statutory history and also in, in practice. And just if you might, any thoughts about questions of displacement, which I understand from at least one of the comments that the OCC uh, proposal did try to get at this question a little bit in the context of mortgage lending. Is there any sort of thought or theory around displacement embedded in the rulemaking? Yeah, we specifically uh, talk about um, not creating inadvertently um, incentives uh, for uh, gentrification, for instance, that might actually be giving credit uh, while displacing uh, LMI communities. And we think there are a variety of safeguards that we have put in our metrics-based approach that would actually guard against uh, those risks. And we ask a number of additional questions to see whether stakeholders um, think there are things that we should do there that we didn't capture uh, in uh, the ANPR. Um, all right, so final question, if I might, to end where you started or where you ended your remarks, which was your hope for the potential of convergence. Um, I think it'd be useful to hear your thoughts about where you think this approach and the OCC approach actually converge already and where you see sort of hope for the potential uh, shared objectives in the two different approaches, if any. Yeah, so I think there's um, a lot of commonality. Um, you know, we're all trying, uh, I think, uh, to strengthen uh, the CRA, to strengthen uh, the core purpose uh, of the CRA, while also bringing a greater certainty uh, via the use of metrics where appropriate. I think some of the metrics uh, are similar. Um, in fact, uh, we, uh, again, we, we worked together for a long period of time. We shared uh, our database. Uh, we talked about why in some cases we were um, inclined to see loan counts as more um, uh, responsive to LMI needs than loan values, for instance. And I think you can see some of that um, in uh, both proposals. Um, we think that there are certain areas that need to be assessed separately. Um, and that's why we have four subtests. We really do think that it's important um, to use metrics where appropriate, um, but to separately tailor and evaluate um, retail lending relative to community development finance, retail services, and community development uh, services. Um, and uh, I think there are um, areas that uh, are um, uh, very similar in both. Uh, so for instance, we really like the idea of publishing lists of uh, qualifying activities and regularly updating them. And we really like the idea of uh, having a pre-approval process so that banks don't make investments without knowing uh, ahead of time whether they're going to qualify. So. There's other areas um, that are related to um, 
trying to bring greater investment to underserved areas like Indian country. So I think there's a lot of areas of commonality. Um, and I, uh, I think, again, you know, we're going to have really robust comments on uh, the questions that we asked. And I hope that'll allow us all to work together and uh, do what uh, stakeholders have said they want to see, uh, which is converge on a consistent approach. I'm going to, I lied about the final question, but this is really my final question. So with the January 2023 deadline and your 120 day deadline here, so you end up with, yeah, with the OCC rules starting to go really heavily into effect and needing some, if you think about it, sort of lead time for institutions to know what regime they're going to be in, if there would be convergence the sort of window between the end of your ANPR and the possibility of a, of a, a rulemaking uh, to the sort of time at which institutions need to have certainty. Th th that window feels long today, but is actually not that long. Do you think there's enough time for us to possibly reach a convergence? I absolutely do. I absolutely do. We've done so much work and we're going to have such rich responses uh, based on the ANPR um, to add to the extensive feedback we've already gotten in response to earlier notices and the roundtables. So I have a lot of confidence um, that that timing uh, is actually quite, uh, quite good. Great. Well, this is where we would all applaud if we were in person today and say thank you very much, Governor Brainerd, for being with us here at the Urban Institute. Um, and thank you again, let me just say, to you and your staff for clearly a enormous amount of effort. Um, and I'm sure many of us look forward to sharing thoughts in the coming period ahead. Thanks for being with us. Well, thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. And now I'm going to be joined by uh, three uh, of, uh, friends and also three superb analysts on this topic. Um, I'm, in the interest of time, going to uh, not do extensive uh, um, introductions, but I think you all know uh, Urban Institute Senior Fellow Ellen Seidman, co-director of the um, Housing Finance Policy Center, at the Urban Institute, uh, Lori Goodman and Noel Poyo, who is Executive Director of the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders. Um, hi guys. That Hello. was a lot. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you for being with us uh, as well. And um, I'm going to start uh, by asking you to offer uh, some very quick, so let's try to keep room going, but some quick reflections on what you heard. What did you, here that surprised you a little bit? Um, or what was it in the rulemaking and the dialogue this morning that might have surprised you? And um, what are you thinking are the sort of important questions that this community, we have many, many people on the phone who are likely to be commenting, ought to be paying attention to. So why don't we start with that? And um, uh, my, on my box, Lori, uh, you're at the top. So why don't you go first? Well, thank you very much for having us here today. That was just a phenomenal, phenomenal presentation. And the amount of work that the Fed did on this proposal is just mind boggling. So I think you know, there are a couple things. Um, so one thing that didn't surprise me was how well grounded this proposal was in analytic evidence. They clearly spent a lot of time combing through examinations. They combed through over 6,000 examinations. Um, that, that was they had told us that, uh, well, it told us that when she was here in um, January. Um, the second, the one surprise that I had when I actually listened to this proposal, though, was actually how similar the building blocks were of the OCC proposal and the Fed proposal. And this came out a little bit in Lael's comment at the end where she um, emphasized the fact that, um, you know, they both, they both had the, they were both sort of addressing the same thing, which was the CRA had to be modernized, uh, more use of metrics, greater clarity for banks, um, the, um, with the pre-approval process and an emphasis on um, er things outside the assessment areas, but I think when you look at the, um, but when you look at the um, metrics themselves, they're very similar. That is, the OCC has um, one overall metric and then a series of retail lending tests and a, a series and then a, commu a community development test for each um, 
assessment area. The retail lending tests are very, very similar, although in the um, they're although they're they're sort of graded differently, but they're very similar in the Fed proposal, the OCC proposal, and similarly the community development tests at the assessment area are very, very similar between the proposals, again, graded differently. Um, my one question was um, that I, that um, Lael didn't answer and um, I could not find in the, um, and I couldn't find in the document was what, what does public disclosure of the data look like? That is, we know we're gonna get the information that the Fed put together, but on an ongoing basis, are we gonna be able to evaluate the banks in terms of what they're doing for their community and what they're doing and uh, what they're doing for their community in terms of lending and community development? So she did talk about that little dashboard, but you're really she talking about, about the, the underlying the data. What I'm actually talking about is the dashboard was for the banks themselves. So the Fed has paid an incredible amount of uh, attention to how do the banks collect the information? Are we really able to evaluate? My question is, what is the information that we, the public, receive at the end? It's not clear to me that we're going to receive the dashboard. Actually, it's pretty clear to me that we're not. <laughs> um, so, um, so, so that was my, so that was the one question that wasn't, that I couldn't find addressed at all. It could be that it's in the 186 page document, which I merely, which I, um, skimmed through, but did, didn't have time to read carefully. Not yet. You don't read that fast, Lauren? Um, great. Know, thanks. Been, yeah. <laughs> so, Noel, your first, uh, surprises, uh, keep questions. Yeah, so, um, you know, Lori mentioned the sort of uh, the, the data driven approach and the depth of this proposal, it, you know, no surprise, right? This reflects the fact that they've been working on this a long time um, and went through a lot of discussions with the OCC. So, so no surprise there. Um, I'm not going to say I was surprised by the framing uh, around race and, and the civil rights history of this law, but, but I will say that I was pleased by it, right? Um, you know, only a few years ago, that was something we have to remember was, was sort of, you know, oh, I'm not sure if we can sort of talk about that. Um, and so to sort of just very directly and honestly and, 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 and no drama, you know, just sort of saying, look, th this is what the law was. Uh, that's, this is why it was created. I, I think it's very important. Um, and so I'm, I'm pleased to see that. You know, um, I, I appreciate the, the decorum and, and collegiality that you hear uh, from the governor and have seen, heard throughout this process, but it's, it really is worth remembering how truly outside the mainstream the OCC's uh, a change was. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think that sometimes these conversations can, um, can be very decorous, and I think that's important uh, in, in today's, today's age. Uh, but but th there's not that many people in industry, uh, much less in the community development industry um, or, or advocates that, that thought um, that the OCC nailed it on the head. And so this idea of bringing them together in the discussion that you were drawing the governor out on, I think, was, was very interesting um, because there is clearly going to be a need to, need, need to be a change. Um, and, I, and I don't think that that's a, a purely sort of advocate point of view. I think there's a lot of people I hear from the banking industry that, that feel that way. I was left with just a, a couple of questions. Um, one, you know, it's sort of weighing goods. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested to see how the Fed does this. For example, in assessment areas, you know, you think about the good of, uh, of ensuring bank branches, you know, are, are fully recognized. And, and, and the governor specifically mentioned that. You know, on the other hand, uh, opening up assessment areas um, can, can mean investing in persistent poverty counties. Um, that, that in fact don't have much banking presence at all. And so there's a balance to be struck there. Um, you know, it's, you, you'll see it, you know, I, I guess ultimately in the final rule when it comes down to it, but those are very important. And I think different low-income communities stand to benefit from different balances there. And so how we wrestle with that as a, as a nation, as a group of industries and players, I think is terribly important. And um, so some other things, but we'll, we'll keep the conversation going. Okay, great. Um, I want to come back to that process point you made in a minute. Um, but first, before we get to process, Ellen, your surprises, observations, questions? Um, so my first observation is that um, this has an intense focus on community needs. And um, that is um, welcome. 
and to my mind, it's different than where the OCC was. Um, I was actually surprised by the racial focus. I was pleased, um, but I was surprised. Um, when, I was, when I was a bank regulator, the Fed was really one of the strongest agencies on the thought that, oh my God, we can't talk about race because it's not in the statute. So it was incredibly refreshing to hear not only from Governor Brainerd, but actually from the other governors as they were speaking this morning uh, on the subject of race. Um, I was, and, and there are the technical issues here that, you know, it is really important that retail is separate from community development. It is really important that we're not going to monetize services. Um, but I was particularly pleased by the range of thoughtful questions that they're raising and thoughtful pro uh, uh, proposals to get at the smallest of small businesses, to get at minority businesses, to really respond to the capacity problems in rural communities. I mean, these are things that um, are extremely important that banks, both large and small, but in particular, the very largest ones who really do have a lot of, of um, both financial and human capacity uh, can, can help, you know, can work on and can, can make happen if they're given the proper incentives. And I think there's been a real, there's a real focus in this proposal on doing that. So now, um, maybe I'll start with you, Ellen, on this before we come back. I want to talk a little bit more about um, the governor's conversation about the time that's available between now and the beginning of uh, 2023. Um, between now and then, there's one other very noticeable thing that is likely to happen that wasn't mentioned at all. Um, uh, one thing in less than two months, we'll, we'll have uh, an election in this country. Um, uh, but even perhaps without one, she's suggesting she thinks that over time, the two agencies might come to um, a consensus. So I want to just ask you about sort of scenarios, if you will, different scenarios that people across the um, country are thinking about. What would it take um, for there to be a convergence, um, either in personnel or politics, or simply in the strength of the response to the Fed's proposal. Um, uh, the governor kept emphasizing how robust the comment period is. I think there is a strong invitation for people to weigh in on this alternative approach. So, what do you think the different possibilities are? What you know, um, different scenarios we might see. Not all necessarily convergence. Um, Ellen, you start, and Noel. Right. I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, the possibilities just it will give you the polar opposites. Um, range from what the governor talked about at the end, which is that we actually have two, you know, we have two separate rules. One applies to, in essence, only 122 banks but they have like 65% of the banking assets in the country. And then we have a second rule that applies to everybody else. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, you get to true convergence where once again, we have a single rule that um, is applicable to, to all banks. Um, I think that even without any change in personnel, um, first of all, the FDIC has not weighed in yet, and um, they are an important potential play. They're an important player in this, and an important um, potential balancer. Um, and but second, and I think I, I really do think that this is important. That by having the 120-day comment period, given where we're starting from. I think the hope is that many of the comments will be about how to come to a convergence. They won't just be, I like this in the Fed proposal and, and I don't like this in the, in the OCC proposal. That, that commenters will be thoughtful in helping the Fed find, and the OCC and the, and the FDIC find convergence. 
maybe that's wishful thinking, but I think that the Fed has given us a good chance. Yeah. And Noel, before you mention, I just want to, we have one qu uh, question in the chat from uh, Timothy Herwig, who uh, is identified as being at the Office of Thrift Supervision, but I think that must be a former role. Um, that was a former role. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but he makes the point that um, the size of the um, uh, deposits that the F the Federal Reserve Board supervises in this context is very, very small. And so he's asking really about the degree of clout that the Fed has, at least on CRA, if not in other matters, in this context, and how likely that is to influence the outcome. So just if you would, in your response, and I'll address that as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I, the other thing that I'll, I'll say that maybe surprised me a little bit was this morning there was a unanimous vote to move this forward. And that's, that's no small matter because, um, you know, I, I think it's very important for us to remember that Governor Brainerd's, you know, sort of face is out front right on this and has been, but, but this is an institution. And indeed the chairman has, has weighed in on this um, and, and rightly so, um, not, not simply in support of Governor Brainerd's leadership, but, but, but as, a, as a policy measure for where the Federal Reserve goes. I, I think the idea that the Fed only supervises, you know, some portion of the industry, uh, to, from my perspective, is not particularly a, a metric of the extent to which the, the Federal Reserve staff and the governors are, are indeed the leaders on this issue. Um, and, you know, I think that, that Governor Powell has made it very clear that you know, even from the largest issues of monetary policy, that there is a, a, a view of the macroeconomic conditions in the United States and an acknowledgement that, you know, racial wealth gap, ethnic wealth gap, um, th that these issues are deeply corrosive to global competitiveness, um, to, to the future economic growth. This is a highest level challenge in our economy. And so if the CRA is one of the single most important policies that, that the regulators have for trying to address those things, and you indeed do view them as a central challenge for our economy writ large, well, then no surprise, right, that there's this level of focus. But I, I think we can get easily lost in the sort of, this is, this is for the community folks, you know, or, or that, that sort of view. Um, and, I, and I'll just say, you know, as, as a community folk, um, uh, that from an advocacy perspective, that you know, this election matters a ton in what this rule is going to end up looking like. But as a commentator, I, I take uh, Ellen's point among others, of, you know, very well that there is, there's a lot of the substantial similarities here and there's a need to bring these together. Um, and, and that has frankly nothing to do with the election. Uh, but again, let's not underestimate the impact the election will have on it. It's not your father's Federal Reserve, um, regardless of the electoral outcome. Laurie, other thoughts on process before I turn um, to the so data? I was actually going to say, um, you know, I actually, as um, well, I was thinking, I was trying to figure out, well, how would you bring these together? And there was actually a kind of fairly obvious path forward in my mind. And that is that given the similarities between the retail lending tests done by the Fed and done by the OCC, you start with those and then you aggregate it up into a sort of combined, so in the end, you've got to give the bank a single rating. Um, and so that aggregation, the, the tests are done separately and then they're aggregated at the end in perhaps a slightly more quantitative manner than the Fed would, would like and a lot less quantitative, and a, uh, more qualitative manner than the OCC would like, but you start with the, the commonalities and then you bring it together in a single test, which you have to do for a single rating anyway. So the tests are conducted separately. There's no one metric and then they're sort of averaged at the end, which they have to be. But it just seemed like there was a way to bring it together given the incredible amount of similarities between the two proposals. So I want to come back to what Ellen described as something that was uniquely, not uniquely, but more um, strongly characteristic of the Fed proposal, which is it does seem to center on the community in different yes. ways. Um, they each are uh, understanding the burdens, I think, and we'll come back maybe to reg burden in a minute on the institutions. Um, and they've both uh, spoken about that, but the Fed sort of balances that more strongly uh, with uh, 
issues of community need. So what are some of the mechanisms you see here and what are some mechanisms perhaps you don't see here that we that the common period could address around um, making sure that we get to this more differentiated set of uh, community need. And I'll just mention also the earlier proposal, um, the governor emphasized a bit more um, economic volatility and different economic periods and how their approach, uh, they argued, was much more um, consistent with that. I didn't hear that here. And I also wonder if that is just because she didn't talk about it today or if you think there's something different and this has changed in their proposal. So first thoughts on community need, Ellen? Um, yeah, so um, the, the biggest uh, difference that allows the Fed a greater focus on community needs is that there is no overall single dollar denominated bogey for a bank to, um, uh, let's put it this way, aim for and not go any higher than. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in fact, uh, one of the major problems with the OCC proposal is that since there is this bogey, all of the multipliers that are meant to enhance um, incentives for Indian country and CDFIs and things like that, in fact, can result in less lending being done and less investment being done. So that is the biggest, biggest difference and it's absolutely critical. But I think that um, there are other things in here that are really important uh, in terms of community needs. The focus on number of loans, in, uh, particularly with respect to small business rather than the amount of the dollars. The focus on rural needs. The, fo the understanding that capacity is as important in many cases as dollars lent. And, and focusing in on encouraging the banks to help build that capacity through the way the service test is going to be um, uh, uh, evaluated. And then um, finally, uh, the focus on making, making maximum use of the intermediaries who seem to be able to get into the communities in a way that many, many banks really can't the minority deposit institutions, the CDFIs, the low-income credit unions, and others who, um, who, who do seem to be able to go, to place, go into places where the larger banks um, have more trouble. Uh, so Noel and Laurie, I'm going to ask you to talk about community needs, but also um, uh, CRA deserts and rural areas, and your thought about their approach here. Sure. Um, sure. So one, one, I'll just say that, that it's, it's worth us distinguishing what the proposal sort of makes possible or, or points to around community needs and I'll say opportunities, we are talking about investments here, um, and community voice. Um, and so there is, I, I think, really a, a great deal to like about the process for identifying, quantifying and investing in community needs and opportunities. Um, there are some directional indicators around community voice, but I think a lot more to be done. Um, I, I think you, know, you look at uh, the OCC proposal is, is getting challenged uh, by California Reinvestment Coalition and CRC. Um, you, you, you see a lot, of, you know, th this is a fundamental difference in approach, but I don't want to um, over speculate where, where the Fed is based on what's actually in the rule and what's been discussed with regard to community organizations, which have been much, much vilified um, as, a, as a, a conduit for informing this process, but I, I would argue are incredibly important for it. Um, and, uh, you know, Ellen, you mentioned uh, this idea of capacity building as a, a sort of central point around, you know, bringing these issues together, bringing community need and, and investing community and community voice together. I think it's terribly important and probably needs more focus, um, uh, you know, com coming out of this proposal. Um, but the, and, and on, on the, the sort of investment deserts, um, I, that, that was sort of the point earlier I brought up that I'm, 
it's not clear to me what the step is yet. So it's clear what the opportunity is, but the places in the country that are not seeing CRA investment in the most dramatic ways don't have banks, right? Um, and so there, there is really a fundamental difference that has to be, or, or change that's to be made in assessment areas to truly solve this in colonias on the border, um, in parts of the Delta, in Puerto Rico, and in, in other territories. Uh, you know, there, there is, um, again, I, I don't want to speculate too far based on what we see, because I think there, there is yet some important steps for the Fed to take. So Laurie, you get the last word Okay, here. so just to pick up that theme, yes. Um, so the Fed proposal sort of makes it but the AMPR makes it clear that the you know area the deserts outside of assessment areas are a huge problem, but it doesn't it's not exactly clear how how they solve it. It's one of their questions. Um, I think um, one focus on community needs, which I think is very very important, is on their retail lending tests. They if the if the bank has more than a fifteen percent share in that assessment area, they have to take that test as opposed the OCC proposal where it's 15% of the bank's total nationwide profile. So they're, so banks are important in certain activities in certain areas where they're not being measured. And I think the Fed makes it those tests very community-based. And then the third point that I want to make, which um, Lael didn't emphasize, but I thought, actually thought was very neat. And that is that they, that, you know, for um, many um, LMI borrowers, many, um, Black and brown borrowers are just underbanked. They just don't, they don't have a toehold at all, and they're making um, the range of depository the range of deposit instruments to support those um, potential borrower poten potential depositors a, an explicit part of the retail service test. And I thought that was actually very very cool. Um, well, thank you, all three of you, for the first taste uh, many of us uh, will have on trying to dig into this rule. I think it will be the subject of much discussion, uh, even in a very crowded season. Um, and I do think it's very notable that, uh, as I said, this isn't your father's Federal Reserve because it's not um, the, the country is not the same country that we had. Both the uh, understanding of the importance of an inclusive kind of growth and um, our ongoing um, real responsibility to remedy um, the history of uh, racial discrimination in lending and in sort of creating the communities that we face, I think is it's different and that's influenced the Fed. And, and that for me, someone who spent time working on CRA uh, 25 years ago with these institutions, it feels like a very different moment. That said, as we dig into the details, I strongly suspect that both institutions and advocates in the community development sector will find things they like and things they don't like about this proposal. And uh, it, we'll look forward to uh, digging into some of those comments as clearly the Fed does as well. My thanks to the, again to the governor and to her team for putting um, the effort they did into the rule and for being our partners in putting this together on the very first day the rule came out. And of course, thanks to Noel, our guest, and to our urban colleagues. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Farewell. Be Thank well. you. Thank you.